when I was in the reigning world champion. Um, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> and you're also three-time Olympic medalist, one of each color, including the individual bronze at the most recent Olympics. Thank you so much for being here. First of all, what have you been up to since we last saw you at the World Championships? Um, I've been a little bit busy. Uh, I was doing the Stars on Ice tour following the Olympics, uh, a couple other smaller tours uh, around. Um, but mainly what I've been doing was the Thank You Canada tour that traveled across Canada for two months, which was such an amazing experience. Um, other than that, I've been just spending time with my friends and my family um, and my pets. One is crawling on me right now, <laughs> so it's uh, pretty good. Speaking about the Thank You Canada Tour, you, you did travel for two months. You skated with basically all of your teammates from the team event at the Olympics, which won the gold medal. Mm -hmm. How was that experience, and how was it to night by night skate in front of sold-out crowds to watch all of you skate? It, it was pretty incredible. We went to all the smaller venues and the smaller um, markets in Canada, so it was more of where I came from. I'm from a very small town in Newfoundland, so being able to see those smaller places, have a more intimate, uh, intimate show, have the audience closer to the ice, uh, not as many of them, but still full, and it was just really remarkable, and then also being with such an amazing cast, uh, being able to share the ice with them, share experiences with them, be on a bus with them for two months. Um, it got, it, we all got pretty close. <laughs> and didn't you, weren't you on the bus that also went to Nashville to do Scott Hamilton's tour? I yeah. was on the bus, the yeah. 45 hour bus ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we hit like every single snowstorm, so yeah. it took a lot longer. Yeah, I saw, I saw that it was quite the adventure to get there. Uh, yeah. So you started skating at the age of three because your older sister was already involved in the sport. What are some of your earliest memories of it and what aspects of the sport drew you in the most at that point as a kid? Um, well, a lot of my early, early memories of when I first started skating are not really memories. They're pretty much just what I was told. Um, but apparently the first day that I stepped on the ice, I was holding onto my parents' hands and I was mad because they weren't skating as fast as my sister. So they let me go. And after I fell like five times, I got up and started chasing her too. So that was pretty much the first time I got on the ice. Um, after that... One of my favorite things that I know is actually skating in the mornings before school. Um, we would skate from like 6 to 8 in the morning. I would wake up in the morning, my dad would have my skates all warmed up next to the fireplace. We'd tie them at the house and then make our way to the rink. And I would just get on and it didn't matter whose program was on, I'd be skating to it. Wow. Uh, yeah. Choreographing my own programs. Um, jumping whatever I wanted, but it was the programs and spins that I loved the most, and that's what drew me into skating. Did you have any, uh, did, did you watch skating, and did you have idols when you were growing up? I didn't, I don't have many memories of watching skating when I grew up. Um, I remember I watched like Sasha Cohen, Michelle Kwan, um, but I don't have many memories of it. I just remember the names. I know my parents watched it quite a bit, um, but my main idol was my sister. Um, I did want to be like her. I still, to this day, believe she was a better skater than me. Wow. Um, so it was really fun to have, look up to her. At the age of 10, you moved to work with Robbie Walia, and he's been by your side ever since. You train inside a shopping mall, which is a unique situation. Do you think that helped you develop into a stronger performer since there's, you know, there's always people around. There's always people that you don't know. It's not the same faces every single day. There's people that might stop and watch you. Do you think that helped you develop less nerves and more of a performance quality from from being in that situation? Um I'm sure there was an added bonus to to skating at a mall um for that reason, but I was always a natural performer. I loved being on the ice and grabbing everyone's attention um but when I moved to Edmonton I do remember I would always be upset if someone wasn't paying attention to what I was doing or we have a lot of high school kids so they would come over and laugh at us on the ice or throw stuff at us or the fire alerts would go off um so I think it was actually more of like a distraction control and learning how to just phase out the people around you and being able to focus on yourself but definitely um there's many times that I would like crave for people to be clapping when I've finished my program. 
<laughs> and they'd be looking at their phones or something. You'd be like, yeah. what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. uh, you said Robbie has the opposite personality of you. He's calm and strict while you're more bubbly and outgoing. What else can you tell us about his coaching methods that you think made it just click from the beginning? One of the biggest things is that we've always kept it a very skater coach relationship. And whenever I'm on the ice, that is the only thing that um, is being talked about is, is skating and how to make it better and how to um, enjoy my personal life by still being focused on skating. Um, <laughs> so that was one of the biggest things. But then also he was re always really good at um, making sure that I had enough to work on on the ice. I'm really good at being told what to do, <laughs> um, but not really good at creating my own ideas. So um, it was really good to have that for Ravi. He always had a plan. He always knew exactly what to do. Um, he could usually tell how I was feeling a day, some day before I could even tell, and he would know how to balance that. And over the last couple of years, I've definitely learned that he is willing to learn from many other people, uh, learn different training techniques. When I know when Patrick Chan came to work with us last year, he um, developed so many different training techniques for that and different ideas and incorporated it into my own training. You said this before, but I've also read in a few places, you were not a big fan of the jumps initially. You really just wanted to perform and you wanted to, like you said, make your own programs to other skaters' music. Did he teach you to get the huge jumps or were you always fearless with them? Um, I don't know if fearless is the right word, um, but my jumps were always naturally big. Um, Jose Picard got me to land majority of my doubles when I was living in Montreal, and uh, even at that point, my jumps were pretty big to begin with. Um, but when I moved to, my, to Edmonton, Ravi took the height of the jumps and tried to make them more technically, um, technically controlled, so it was a mixture of my height and his technique. Um, but when it came to triples, I was not naturally a triple jumper. <laughs> I didn't have the quick twitch that people need to get around. Um, I had the height, but couldn't get around on three rotations, which made zero sense. <laughs> um, so Ravi was really good at teaching me how to get that quickness. Um, but his biggest strength is definitely technique and how to make the most consistent. You've worked with Lance Vipon for about the same amount of time as Ravi, actually probably the same yeah. amount of time. He's choreographed, I think, all of your short programs throughout your career and, and several free skates. Mm -hmm. Speak a little bit about him and his strengths. Lance is just so much fun. I have been working with him since I was 10 years old, so we're really good at when we're choreographing a program to have a good collaboration between his uh, ideas mixed with my own personality. So he choreographs the main parts, the main steps, the main arms, um, but then he kind of just leaves it to me to get my own take on it. So he leaves it a little bit, um, a little bit where it's not fully finished at first, and I can add in my own my own things, and then he comes back and freshens everything up and makes everything uh, look so much better. But I think one of his biggest strengths is his storytelling. Um, I'm really character driven and when I have a strong character and I know what that character is, I'm able to portray that a lot more. So Lance is really good at creating that story for me, um, whether it's the actual story of the program or a fake story that just gives me that exact personality that I need. Um, we're really good at coming up with that. I know right now you're not focusing on competitions, but when you were, give us an example of what a, a typical training day would be like. So normally my training days were very much the same. <laughs> um, I would train five days a week, about three hours a day, um, besides Wednesdays. Wednesdays we decided as a recovery day, so it's um, a two-hour training day instead. Um, but I would often just wake up in the morning, go to the gym, get my workout done with my trainer or my ballet instructor, depending on the day. Um, and then I would head to the rink and for the three hours of training that I skated, one hour would be dedicated to long program, another would be dedicated to short, and the third would be dedicated to choreography, spins, stroking, um, pretty much everything. <laughs> um, 
but in the sessions that were designated to certain things, I would always have a set plan, whether it was a cardio day where I'd be doing multiple run throughs or it was a technique day. So I'd be breaking down my jumps and learning all the, uh, making sure every technique is together. And then as it got towards the end of the year, uh, I'll be mixing the cardio and the technique sessions together. And that just made for really long days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it was really good. And I worked with Ravi for a lot of the day, um, worked with other coaches on my stroking. So that was pretty much my typical day. Going back to the beginning with you, you were never a skater that really had success at the lower levels. You were novice national champion, and then you won a bronze medal on the junior level. You really, internationally, you didn't have the results that you would typically expect of somebody that's had your success on the senior level. But you did go into the 2012 nationals as a first-time senior, and you won the short program. What was that like, and did all of the instant national media excite you or make you terrified? Um, well, going back to the junior days, I really only did two junior, two yeah. junior Grand Prix. Um, I was late to the triple game, so I went to my two junior Grand Prix without consistent triples. Mm-hmm. I was doing a sauna tow, so it wasn't that much to go on. Um, so that led to me only coming ninth or tenth. Uh, at my junior competitions um, but then heading into the senior year I was injured at the beginning of that year so I missed the junior Grand Prix circuit but that gave me time to focus on learning new things and that's somehow when all my triples clicked in <laughs> I learned how to do a triple triple for the first time um, I learned how to do a triple lutz I didn't compete with it that year until junior worlds um, but it was really exciting when I got to go to nationals and I got that attention. And I think that's when I started getting more excited about skating again is that once I hit senior, that was what I was hoping for my entire career. So um, it was really exciting. The next season, you got assigned to Nebelhorn Trophy to start the year and you won that. Then you go to Skate Canada as, as basically their host pick and you win that as well beating out at the time reigning world bronze medalist Akiko Suzuki. And I know you really, really look up to her. You name Mm -hmm. her as one of your favorite skaters. You were not assigned, though, to a second Grand Prix and therefore did not make the Grand Prix final. And I remember NHK Trophy in Japan, there was a spot available and you were not named to it. You would not fill it. (laughs) Yeah. So what was that like, though? Was that super disappointing? Did you expect to be in the Grand Prix final before Skate Canada happened? Like, was that was that a goal that you had in mind? Or was Skate Canada more of a shock to you? To be completely honest, when I hit senior, I had no idea what a Grand Prix was, really. Um, I only just learned what a senior B was when I was at uh, Neville Horn Trophy. Um, I knew I was going to Skate Canada, but I didn't know how the points made sense. I, I honestly had no clue. I knew that that year, my goal was to go to Nebelhorn, Skate Canada, and then I was going to go to the Skate Canada Challenge. Um, after this, after Skate Canada, I was only aiming to, to not be last, and being first was a complete shock to me. Wow. <laughs> um, it was so exciting. I like I don't even know. That was so long ago, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was only when I got home that people were like, if you have a second Grand Prix, you have a chance for the final. I still had no idea what that meant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then I kept hearing that people were withdrawing from the NHK that year, and I kept wanting to go, but they wouldn't fill the spot. No, so, I, know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why that, that's so frustrating well, that they didn't do that. I don't know. Um, I don't understand how it It, it ended up all right for you in the long run, though. So it's, Yeah, it's it was okay. okay. Yeah. And then you, you won nationals easily later that season. Then you go to your first senior roles, which – happens to be in Canada, in London, Ontario. You were in fourth place in the short program, which again, I mean, this is just a dream season that you did not expect, like you said. But what were some of the best memories that you had from that World Championships? Um, one of the best memories I have is actually that short program. I remember I was only ninth the skate in the short out of so many. Um, and I remember when I was on the ice, it was so... It was my first first experience in a rink that full, um, that loud. It was Canadian Worlds. People were cheering loud. I no one really knew how who I was really at that point. But I remember in my short program, I got so caught up in the noise that I stopped hearing my own music, 
And I think that's one of my favorite memories. <laughs> and I just remember I left the rink after I skated, went back to the hotel, took a nap, took off my all my makeup and my competition hair, went and had lunch. And when I came back to the rink, the last skater was just skating, and they're like, "You're still in third." <laughs> And you I'm might like, need to get ready for the press conference, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I got pushed and forth, and it yeah. was okay. It was so crazy to think about is that I was, after all those out those skaters, I was still holding up, mm-hmm. and it was such an incredible experience and being able to share the ice at my first Worlds um, with all the top skaters um, was something really special. You did stay inside the top 10 after the free skate, which meant that the next season for the Olympics, Canada had two spots for the event. But we saw, in the beginning of the 2014 season, we saw the injuries start to creep in that you had to deal with for the next several seasons. Mm -hmm. You withdrew in the middle of your first Grand Prix event with a hamstring injury, and then you didn't compete at all the rest of the fall season. So there was kind of a question mark, I think, going into nationals, you know, what is is your condition? You won Mm -hmm. nationals, but you talked about the pressure that you had not only from everyone else, but on yourself. Talk a little bit about that. Um, well, going into that season, I was dealing with a couple injuries. I had a stress fracture on my foot, which made me miss the senior B competitions. Uh, I finally healed from that, and I decided I was healthy enough to go to, uh, to Skate Canada. After my initial program, I felt fine. I did a regular cool down, and when I woke up the next morning, I, I couldn't get myself out of bed. I couldn't move my leg enough to walk. Um, I tried to hide it, just thinking that I was sore. Um, so I walked all the way to the rink, warmed up, and when I got on the ice, I couldn't even hold an edge on my leg. Uh, later on, I found that I tore my hamstring, so um, that wasn't pleasant. <laughs> um, so that was really upsetting for me right away, missing pretty much all my summer competitions, finally getting back in competition, being injured again. Um, but I got myself ready for our Ski Canada Challenge, and... I ended up winning that one, but I was still only doing about half a program. And when I got to nationals, I was so ready. I still really didn't know what the whole Olympics thing was. I was still new to that um, to that world, but I did know that there was a lot of people who had just seen me at Worlds the year before, finished eighth, uh, finishing eighth, and that I was wanting to be on that on that Olympic team. And it was the first time that I had any sort of pressure on me um but it was more about nationals to prove to myself that I could come back from anything um later on I realized it's probably a good thing that I did that (laughs) the year after was much worse (laughs) yeah um but that was a really good motivation for me to feel strong uh have my skate of my life at that nationals uh, up to that point so it was something really good then you go to the Olympics yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you go to the Olympics, though, and you, you skated to a team silver medal and a 13th place finish in the individual competition. But this was the first time that the team event was part of the Olympics. No one really knew what to expect of it. It, it kind of was, it didn't seem like it was stressful at all. I mean, you saw teams from other countries cheering for each other. Everyone just looked like they were having fun. Was it as much fun as it looked? I absolutely love the team event. Um Back in 2014, it was a little bit more different for me. I knew that I just wanted to skate on, I was excited to skate and to perform, Um, but I didn't really know much of the other team um, to fully engage into all that team atmosphere. So I just felt like the little tag along in the back of the circle, just like, hi, I'm here, guys. (laughs) Um, So that was, uh, it was really fun for me to perform, but it is a really cool experience seeing everyone from the teams down at the end of the ice, um, sitting in the little box and cheering on for the rest of the teammates. It's really fun. Moving <laughs> on to 2015, you you had a broken leg and you were out the whole year. So did you think you were ever going to come back to the sport during that time? And how hard was it to stay motivated knowing you know, you're missing all this time, skaters might be passing you by, the, the technical level might be increased? What was it like to have to sit out and just watch everybody else? Um, so that year was definitely a down year for me. 
um, in more ways than one. Uh, not only did I break my leg, but I was also completely um, unmotivated. I didn't want anything to do with skating. I didn't want to get back on the ice at all. I didn't want to watch skating. I didn't want to hear a tell of skating. Um, actually, during the national championships that year, I took off and went to Mexico for the week, and I was like, I just don't want to. I don't want to see any of this. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know any of it. Um, I pretty much just boycotted skating for a little while. Um, but I did actually get back on the ice in November. Um, I was more scared to tell my coach that I really didn't want to compete. I really didn't want to skate. Uh, it was the first time in my life my parents almost forced me to get on because they didn't want me scared of being on skates because it's been my entire life up until I was, I don't know, 18, I think it was. So up to that point, everything was just skating, so they didn't want me to be scared. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll get back on the ice. I'll do as I'm told. I really didn't try all that hard. I just did what everyone told me to. Told me to. I tried to get back into my jumping, but it was just so painful. I didn't have the muscle strength in my leg. Uh, once I finally started getting a little bit better, my foot got worse. I ended up going for a second surgery, and that just unmotivated me even more. But when I got back from that second surgery is when things started to look up a bit more. Um, I started getting the strength back in my foot. It started being less painful. My coach sent me to seminars and shows. Um, and kind of tricked me back into training by creating all these exercises to fix my technique. He was really happy for that year off, actually, because it made sure that he was had time to fix things that he hated about my jumps. Mm -hmm. um, so he pretty much created all these exercises to get me back in shape without me actually realizing it. <laughs> and, smart guy, very smart. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was it was definitely really smart, and up to that point, I didn't realize what he was doing. I just kept saying, "Yeah, sure, whatever, I'll do it." Um, so I can definitely say for the, about a year and a half post breaking my leg, I skated for other people other than myself, and that's what kept me going. Going into 2016 nationals, you're recovered. You're considered a favorite again, but you dropped to third place overall, and then you you just barely you were not named to the world team. You said afterwards that this played a big part in then going to a sports psychologist. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that and the changes you personally started to see afterwards. Well, when I was younger, um, about 16, 17, I started working as a sports psychologist, but I didn't understand what that actually meant. Um, Ravi pretty much told me, this will help your training. Um, but at 16, I just thought that he was being mean and saying that I was doing, I thought I was doing something wrong. So I was just more angry on my sports psychologist than anything. So that relationship did not mix well. So after I got back into the training uh, in that year of competing where I did miss the world team, um, that was a pretty rough year for me. I got nervous for the first time in my life. But I went to Neville Horn Trophy and I won it and I was like, okay, no, we're fine. This year is going to be fine. I'm back to normal. And then I went to Skate Canada and had the personal worst skate of my life. Yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you actually about that Skate Canada. So you you had the funny error in the short program. You you did a belly flop basically, and you could you could see that it kind of knocked the wind out of you. Oh, it split flopped. It wasn't just a belly a flop. Split flop. Yeah. Okay, we'll call it that. <laughs> so, but do do you think that in the free skate? I mean, we're you fell four times. I think you singled pretty much everything else. It, it was I not doubled a... everything. I doubled okay, you everything. doubled, doubled, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that that short program mistake is what caused the problems in the free skate? Um, I think it was a mixture of things. Uh, but definitely the short program fall didn't help situations. Um, I ended up injuring my one of my legs, which made it really... It's really long ago. I remember falling and I remember going to physio a lot that week. Um, mm -hmm. But I do remember being in a lot of pain and that made, a, made it really difficult for me to check out of my jumps. Um, and I hate using that as an, as an excuse, but um, to be completely honest, I probably shouldn't have competed that long program. Mm -hmm. um, I need it more for my own mental being. And even though I fell on every single jump in that long program, <laughs> I just watched it not long ago. It was not a pleasant program. Um, Everybody has it. <laughs> I need it one of them anyways. I've had a few, but that was probably the worst. Um, I think I need it to compete that program whether it went well or not. And it didn't matter that I dropped to 11th place 
and it didn't matter that I fell on every jump. When I got off the ice, I was just excited that I didn't withdraw. Mm-hmm. And after a year and almost two full years of withdrawing from random things, I finally could say that I finished a full competition. And that set me up to go to, NH- uh, to NHK, I think I went to that year. And even though it didn't go perfect, it did what it did go better than the one before, and I managed to come sixth. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what I needed to help me keep going and go to nationals that year. Um, but it wasn't until I came third that it fully clicked in that I'm like, okay, I need to start refocusing my life and move on and figure out what it is if I'm going to put myself through all this competition and uh, training. I'm going to do well at these competitions and training. So you went you went back though, kind of circling back. We see that you working with a sports psychologist again at an older age, more mature. You know, you're understanding why you have it, why you're going to the sports psychologist. What uh, can you talk a little bit about what you learned in that second go around that started to change your skating because it was the next season that we saw a completely different skater. So the first few times that I saw my sports psychologist, um we didn't talk much about what to do to improve my skating. We were talking about why it was that I was skating. And for the first hour, I couldn't give her a straight answer. I had no idea why I was skating. And I think that was the biggest thing that made it hard for me to skate because I've always wanted to perform and I lost that sense of wanting to do that. Mm -hmm. So first I had to break through that barrier and figure out why it was that I was still skating. And then we had to figure out why I was scared to do what I wanted to do. I was scared of competing, I was scared of training, I would be nervous skating on the ice on a six minute warm up um, because everyone's moving so fast and I got so scared of being on the ice with other people, I was so um, wrapped up in my own self that I couldn't figure out what to do, I was so worried about what other people were doing. Um, So then we had to break through that and to be completely honest, the first four, maybe five sessions, I pretty much just cried through them. And until I got all of that out of me, uh, we weren't able to think about other things. Um, but that was the biggest thing for me was to get that done. And then I, right after those sessions is when I went to Finlandia uh, and I won that competition. And um, that was really exciting for me because I actually hurt my knee a little bit on my long program warm up. But I thought back to all the sessions that we just did and figuring out that a lot of why I was scared was because I was so scared of being injured. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, if I'm injured this time, who cares? If I dealt with worse. Um, And I went out and did a really good long program, scored my personal best up to that point, um, and then got off the ice and told my coach that I think I hurt my knee. (laughs) (laughs) We we did see, though, somewhere in this 2017 season, you kind of changed your way of thinking. And I, I believe that it was that you broke your free skates up into two sections. So you had that Mm -hmm. first big section that you never had a problem with in your life. Triple, triple, never a problem. Started doing double axle, triple toe, not a problem. But then you get to that triple loop and that that really was, it was, it, it, it would tell the story of how the rest of the skate was going to go more often than not. We saw that the loop was a beauty in practice almost always, but then you go into competition and for some reason that was the jump that was the hurdle for you. Was there anything specific that you did to change your mindset to say, well, hey, like this loop is fine. I don't know why it's such a hurdle. And what was the process like to actually start landing it and, and be confident for the rest of the program? Um, well, like you said, my loop in practice was rarely missed. Um, my loop in shows was like my most consistent jump in shows. Um, but there was something about that point in a program that that was always my hardest jump. It wasn't the fact that it was a loop. It was just unfortunate that that was the jump that was there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's that section of the program that is the second half mark where your body is changing, the energy systems that it's doing, your mind is switching from this is a brand new program, this is the start of the program, to oh my god, we're halfway, let's get to the end of this program. <laughs> um, and Actually, the year, the 2017 year, I still did a double loop at Worlds, <laughs> um, but I stopped putting all the pressure on that jump. The first couple times that I missed it, I was landing everything else in the program. It was just frustrating me that that was the one thing that I was missing all the time. And then I started putting too much pressure on that loop and missing the things after it because I'd be so disappointed on missing the loop. So finally, we changed it. We're like, okay, you know what? No matter what happens on that loop, 
just forget about it. <laughs> and that was my biggest changing it, turning point is when I admitted that that loop was going to be the hardest jump in my program. It took a lot of the pressure off the rest of the program. And I was able to just miss that loop and move on from it. And then we'll figure out how to do that loop another time. For a long time, though, you didn't even include the loop in your programs, even though you had the jump in practice. What is the story behind that? So I actually didn't have my loop in practice. No. Oh. It wasn't until I broke my leg that I learned how to do a triple loop. Wow. Um, only because I built up so much strength in my other leg and learned so much technique on that leg that my loop finally became a possibility. Um, and it would involve nothing with the other leg. So I was mm -hmm. very much okay with just doing loops. So my loop was my last jump to get. And then we didn't include it the year I came back right away. No, we did. I did it. That was the one jump I actually landed at Skate Canada that year. But I started doing it in shows, and I was consistent in landing it in shows. I was like, okay, yeah, we'll add it to the program. Um, but it, it just never worked. I know, I think at the end of, at Nationals the year that I moved to third, we took the loop out of the program to take the pressure off the rest. Um, and we added it back in for four continents that year. So it was just a jump that we continuously kept taking in and out of the program. Um, until finally we just said, you know what, this jump's going to go in there, it's going to work eventually. <laughs> and it did. It's, it's, it did. It was a beauty all year. So. It took all the way into the Olympics to yeah. actually go in there. <laughs> uh, we saw you win silver at 2017 Worlds. Great skating, <laughs> obvious, clear silver medalist. And your teammate, Gabby Daleman, was right behind you, and that allowed three skaters to compete at 2018 Olympics and Worlds. So in the two worlds that you really needed to deliver, you did, and you helped other skaters get the chance to go to the Olympics. 2018, though, we saw that you had wanted to skate to Black Swan slash Swan Lake the year before, but Jeffrey Buttle ultimately choreographed a different free skate for you. Did you quickly remind your team when it came time to think about programs that you still wanted to skate to this? Um, everyone knew because I was begging for that program for many years. Um, but actually it was Jeff who contacted Ravi after I competed when we started talking about music again. And the first thing he suggested was how about we re revisit the Black Swan idea. Um, and then I was hooked. I was like, yeah, you, do you don't have to convince me. <laughs> um, and the point of Lab OM, the program that I did the year before, was to make myself more graceful because that was one of the biggest things for Black Swan was that I don't have the typical balletic shape. I also don't have the typical balletic um, uh, gracefulness. <laughs> so the lines weren't the greatest all the time on the ice. Put in Lab OM almost as like a stepping stone for me and to learn how to portray that new balletic side but it was almost too soft <laughs> I love the program but Black Swan had the power and the gracefulness and we mixed those together which made it much more me so when you were when you were choreographing this program you obviously wanted to skate to it for a long time so you had in your mind probably this is what I want to do this is kind of the music I, this is the flow I wanted to have so if you had to summarize kind of what is the story behind the program? What would you say it is? When I first started this program, I had a, I liked the story from the movie more than the actual ballet mm. uh, story. I love the darkness and the battle of the swan being the one person, the, the battle of trying to be that perfect, perfect self, which being a skater, that's what we're always dry is like, striving for is to be perfect, to do exactly what we're told. Um, but it sometimes can make us a little bit robotic. And then it was the black swan self that I tried to say is like my more personal life. Um, always wanting to be a little bit more free, wanting to try new things. Um, but then my white swan self would be like, no, 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 you can't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it was kind of just more like a personal a personal story for me is to show both sides of the white and black swan and show both sides of myself, the side that most people see on the ice, but then the, what my friends see off the ice. And it's the battle of trying to mix those two together. And it's not until the very end of that that you actually realize, like, this, that's what you have to do. You have to mix both sides of yourself. You can't just separate them. Um, and that meant that every single time that I went out on the ice, I literally gave another piece of me away. 
but um, it was completely worth it. It made that program so special for me. And because I had that storyline in my mind of being able to portray not just the black swan, but portraying the white and black swan and showing the battle between the two, we actually picked the music as we choreographed sections of the program and then blended them together afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>